Good morning. It's good to be with you all today. I want to start out with a story. Uh, in 2013, my family moved, Carmen and I, and our youngest, Cade, or at that time, our little one, Cade, our oldest, actually, uh, moved to a small town in Indiana where we would spend the next five years. Uh, when I say small town, this is a very small town. There were 500 people in the town, 800 people in the entire county. And we brought our newborn with us, and while we were there, we would have two more kids, and we were there five years total, but within the first 24 hours of being there, we learned an awful lot about that community. Uh, it actually provided us with a pretty accurate profile of what living there would entail. And it started with driving down Main Street and nearly getting rear-ended at a stop sign. Uh, only then to have the person who nearly rear-ended us lay in on their horn and provide a kind of universal gesture to us that indicated his displeasure. Um, that was actually the first wildlife we saw in Indiana. It was a bird. Uh, it's not what we expected from a town that referred to itself as the Mayberry of the Midwest. And anyway, we, we uh, carried on with our day. We got to the grocery store where apparently they were... They had figured out that when you're the only grocery store within half an hour, you can charge $7 a gallon for store brand milk. Um, and, and that's when we started hearing people complain about a change that had arrived in the town. Within the last 24 hours, something brand new had occurred there. There was a brand new, for the first time ever, stop sign on Main Street. And most people were just figuring it out that morning, including the person who laid in on their horn behind me and uh, waved at me with only one finger. Uh, as the week went on, we learned just how unpopular that stop sign was. The whole town basically unanimously hated it. Never mind the, the child who had to get hit by a car in order for that sign, sign to be put up in the first place. They said he would lose his limp after a few years of physical therapy. And what was he doing and playing in the street anyway? The stop sign just wasn't the Mayberry way. It didn't belong there. End of discussion, it shouldn't have been there. That's, that's just how it was. They, they did discuss it, actually. I say end of discussion, but they talked about it for at least the next year or so. But that just wasn't how things should be. Now, I'm, I'm illustrating that story because, or I'm sharing that story because it illustrates something that, uh, that we're going to explore today, which is the human tendency toward the predictable or the usual or the, the well-known there's a human tendency to work hard to protect what we know and are comfortable with. A human tendency to protect the status quo, but often the status quo isn't God's best for us. And so we're going to split our time today between two stories because we've been in a series, uh, which we're going to continue, that explores some character profiles, some, some people in Scripture who uh, were impacted by the resurrection of Jesus and so we're going to look at before and after stories, as we have been doing. Uh, last week, Emily did a wonderful job of sharing Peter's story. We're going to continue today by looking at the story of Paul. But I also recognize, and I want us to remember, that it is Palm Sunday, which is a really important part of the Christian calendar, and where it's where we're actually going to begin today, because it's going to provide a platform for us to talk about what's happening with Paul. So we're going to begin in... Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent out two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt. Other gospels say a donkey, a colt of a donkey, tied there which no one has ever written, ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, say the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And when they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. He went along. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came to the place near where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. 
Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's start with some context behind this passage. A hundred years prior to this event, Julius Caesar, following a triumphant battle, would ride his stallion through the streets of Rome in celebration of their triumph, finally stopping at Caesar's palace where he lived. This, this tradition spread over time, and governors such as Pontius Pilate in Jesus' day would do the same thing in the, government, and in the territories they governed, initiating a, a, parade, a parade of Roman triumph culminating at Pilate's court. And so when Jesus rides in an, on, on a donkey, he isn't doing something for which no one has any context. They have a sense of what he's doing. They already know he is a part of this parade. Now, if you can put yourself in the shoes of a faithful Jew in Jesus' day, here are people who claim that this Jesus is the long-anticipated Messiah. And you have lived your life under Roman authority, and you have longed for the day when you would no longer be under Rome's thumb. And this supposed Messiah rides into Jerusalem in an act clearly designed to recall the triumphant entry of Caesar or of Pilate, but in some ways it even seems to be mocking them. Like, rather than a a war horse or a stallion, Jesus is coming in on a donkey. Jesus rides in on a a humble animal of peace. This could could either be viewed as Jesus doing something new and different, or it could even be viewed as a, a caricature of Rome, as sort of mocking them. Donkey has the same double meaning then as it does today. Jesus could be understood as making a donkey of Pilate. And so you've imagined your whole life anticipating a day when the Messiah would come and overthrow the Roman authorities and restore Jerusalem to its former glory as the capital of an independent Israel and nation. And when Jesus rode in on the donkey, if you can put yourself in those shoes, what would it say to you? How would it stir up your hope? Is Jesus here to bring about a revolution? Is he here to usher in this new age of God's chosen people? What is he at work doing? Surely the streets would be lined with people shouting things at him like, Hosanna, which means save us. Save us from Roman rule. And the things that they anticipated are very much the things that Jesus did. He brought about revolution, but not the revolution they anticipated. He brought in the new age of God, but not the new age they anticipated. He brought salvation, but not the salvation they anticipated. And so picking up where we left off in Luke 19, starting in verse 41, it says, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The day will come when you, uh, upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and circle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Now that doesn't sound like the overthrow of Rome, does it? That's not the the triumph that the people anticipated. And going just a bit further in this passage, starting in verse 45, it said, when Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Other gospels talk about Jesus overturning tables and driving out animals with a whip of cords. But what's the most significant in this passage, I think, is that after entering triumphantly, and having the support of this huge crowd of people who are excited for what he's there or what they believe he's there to do, rather than riding his donkey right up to Pilate's court and overthrowing the governor and starting this rebellion, this revolution, and taking back the territory for the Jews, cleansing the land of the Romans, Jesus rides his donkey to the temple courts, God's temple, and rather than cleansing Jerusalem of Roman authority, he cleansed the temple of corruption, which if we wanted to get deep and personal today, we could, we could spend an awful lot of time right there. This idea of 
cleansing from within, asking ourselves some of the hard questions about whether the religious practices of our day are serving God or whether they're serving capitalism by encouraging us to function as consumers of religion rather than bearers of God's Holy Spirit. We could go there. Instead, we're going to leave that little loaded statement just for you to have to wrestle with later if you choose. And by the way, I hate it when preachers do that. Just drop it right in front of you and you have to deal with it later. They dangle that most provocative idea of the whole message right there. Well, that's yours to wrestle with now. And in this case, all I have to say about that is na 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 <laughs> What we're going to do instead is just observe that the temple was operating in a way that hurt people. And Jesus wasn't okay with it. It was keeping the status quo. It was keeping things firmly the way things were. Other translations really focus on the fact that Jesus knocked over the tables of the money changers and people, the, the people who converted one currency to another. Th this is significant for a few reasons. One is because it sorts out insiders and outsiders. The coins used in the, the temple were Tyrian shekels and only the, it was the only coin, Roman coin minted in Jerusalem specifically for the purpose of paying the temple tax. And if you lived in Jerusalem, you might already have a handful of these coins. You would have no need for a money changer. But if you traveled in from a distance, you would need to trade your foreign currency for a Tyrian shekel in order to be able to do business in the temple courts. The money changers would do that for you, of course, but there would be a fee. And so it was a little more expensive to worship if you weren't right there in Jerusalem. If you were an outsider, worship cost a little more. The other thing is just how commercial the temple had become. The temple courts were a booming business. The, the place intended for worship was a racket that was making people rich. And so Jesus saw the temple being abused and the faithful being exploited and burdened. And for most people, that's just the way things worked. That's just how it was. Even if it was unfair, what could you do about it? This system is bigger than we are, but Jesus saw this, and rather than accepting it for what it was, he took action to disrupt the status quo. And this, probably more than anything else, was the biggest push in a chain of events that led directly to his crucifixion. Rather than marching up to Pilate and demanding reform and starting a revolution, Jesus marched up to the temple and initiated reform from within, which corresponded to the revolution that he was at work bringing into the world and into human hearts. Now, there's a lot more we could explore there, so many directions that we could go with this passage, but I want us to turn to Paul's story because I think there are parallels in what's happening on, on uh, Palm Sunday and what happens with Paul. And we first meet Paul in Acts chapter 7, and by now Jesus has died and he's been resurrected and he has entrusted his followers with his mission, his church, his message to live according to his kingdom and to usher in this new reality. And Jesus has ascended into heaven and left this work to his people. And the church now is taking off. In Acts chapter 2, we learn that thousands are being welcomed into the church. The church is living in radical ways. They're sharing their resources to meet the needs of others. Real, wonderful ministry is happening and people are responding to it. But not everyone's happy about it. Not everyone's happy because this new movement is highly disruptive. It's authorities, the same authorities who worked hard to kill Jesus, because killing Jesus meant killing the Jesus movement, are pretty upset to see this taking place. Their, their work to crucify him seems to have backfired, and people are now more committed to Jesus than ever before. Now, some of the faithful followers of God are seeing that, that there's a continuation, that Jesus' story is a continuation of God's story of redemption, while other faithful followers of God see the Jesus movement as a threat to their faith. The, the people are divided. Some see Jesus as a continuation of Israel's story, and others see him as a threat to their faith. It's new, and it's different, and it turns all that they had expected upside down and on its head. And so many, particularly those with power, to protect or to gain, began to persecute early Christians. And in Acts 6, they seize a Christian named Stephen, and they falsely accuse him of blasphemy against Moses. And, and after Stephen gives a, an impassioned speech, the crowd that had gathered chose to kill him. And that's where we first meet Paul, Paul who was early on called Saul. 
We meet him in Acts chapter 7, starting in verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices all rushed to him, dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. They literally covered their ears so they wouldn't have to hear this message of Jesus. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coat at the feet of a young man named Saul. And there he is for the first time. Saul, also called Paul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Who is victorious in this moment? Was it a victory of Christ through Stephen? Or does victory belong to the crowd who stoned him? If you say that this is a victory that belonged to Jesus and, and that Stephen showed the victory of Christ, I agree with you. But let's confess that it's also a statement of faith. That's a statement of faith. You, you don't see that victory with your eyes. You know it in your spirit. You trust it in your spirit. To a young man like Saul, seeing with his eyes, the crowd must have looked victorious that day, preserving the faith of those against, uh, who were like him, against those who would blaspheme Moses and proclaim Jesus. And, and so, if you were in Paul's shoes, what side would you want to join? The side defending the traditions of faith? Surely that sounds like a noble cause. And it doesn't hurt that they also appear to have victory in this situation. Would you join them, or would you join the ones who are dying for their faith? And what victory is there in dying anyway? What victory is there in death? To, to Saul, the answer must have been none at all. Now later, he'll change his mind. He'll write, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? And he'll answer it, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that an incredible turnaround? Everything changes for him, but, but that's not where we are yet. Because if we continue, the beginning of Acts 8, we read, On that day, the day of Stephen's stoning, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Now, what is Saul doing? He's protecting his faith. And actually, I think that's important. Saul is being faithful according to the way he understood his faith. It just happens to be that he's very misguided. He's persecuting Christians in order to preserve something that's very important to him. He just happens to be getting it very wrong. Saul's angry, and he's afraid of what's being lost, and he's working hard to preserve what's there to keep things exactly as they are. He's He's working hard to keep the status quo, but Jesus intervenes. The final passage we'll read today comes from Acts chapter 9, and it's lengthy. We'll read verses 1 through 22. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, this Jesus movement, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners in Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. 
And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to my people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Paul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who called on his name? And hasn't he come here to take prisoners, take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And so Paul, defender of the way things are and have always been, defender of the comfortable and the status quo, willing to do violence, but unwilling to experience discomfort, had a life-changing, belief-changing, worldview-changing encounter with Jesus, and his life was transformed. As a result, the whole Jesus movement would be transformed. Paul was trying to squash a movement, but instead, just like at the temple, Jesus brought transformation from within. Just like at the temple, Jesus disrupted the status quo, Paul's status quo, and brought about something transformational and new. Paul was trying to save the Jewish faith, but Jesus intervened and saved Paul. Now, it occurred to me as I was putting this message together that it would be another opportunity to talk about resistance to change that sometimes occurs in the church. Right? And and we've we've heard about some of this before, those old stereotypes and tropes about moving from pews to chairs or changing carpet colors, things that have been disruptive in the church in the past. And, and I thought about that, and I thought, what an opportunity we would miss if we didn't talk about openness to transformation in ourselves. We could focus on the church as a body, but, but we'd miss an opportunity on looking at us as individuals. And so we're not going to talk about chairs versus pews or carpet colors. I'm more concerned about how we allow our own faith to be comfortable and status quo at times, rather than allowing it to continue to transform and compel our lives. Paul will go on to live and die for his faith. He'll go on to to live a life compelled by the gospel of Jesus. If faith is a set of beliefs that leads us to a certain ethic, but doesn't lead us to be transformed according to the image of Christ, and then go out and bring transformation to the world, then what good is it really? We're called to be transformed transformers and redeemed redeemers. Our faith isn't intended to be comfortable and status quo. It certainly isn't intended to guard our comfort. It's intended to compel our lives, motivate our our limitless love as we learn to love as Jesus loves, and it's intended to welcome and invite and transform. Our faith in Jesus should compel our entire lives. In fact, those are Paul's own words. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, he says, for Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised again. When our faith protects the status quo, that isn't faith at all. That's convenience. That's predictability. That's comfort. The status quo isn't safe. It is safe. It isn't the adventure we're called to in Christ. But one look at Paul's life and we recognize that his story from this moment on is far from safe. He leaves safety behind. He leaves predictability and status quo behind. He'll travel the world planting and encouraging churches. He'll be arrested and imprisoned and shipwrecked and eventually martyred for his faith. Paul leaves comfort and safety and status quo behind the moment he encounters Jesus. There are also times, by my observation at least, that we allow social preoccupations to inhibit our faith or to inhibit the church. And I'll I'll give you an example Uh, from my own life. I was a kid, uh, uh, I must have been 
first or second grade, and a series of tornadoes. I lived in, in a small trailer park in the middle of Nebraska, and a series of tornadoes came through one night and, and uh, did a lot of damage. It overturned trailers. There were some that rolled three or four times, and I remember uh, my mother knocking on neighbors' doors and saying, this one's going to be bad. Come to our church. We have a basement. You'll stay safe. And I remember so many people, so many of my neighbors gathering in that basement that evening, uh, weathering out this storm and surviving it because it did a tremendous amount of damage. Lives were lost that night. And uh, I also remember the pastor's anger as he learned what had happened. I remember that that was our last night in that church because the pastor was so upset that that kind of person, that kind of trailer park person like me, was welcomed into the church. Didn't match the image he was going for. He wasn't ready for someone to disrupt the status quo. He wasn't ready for changes in the way things were. Now, I, I hope we hear that story and we think, what a shame that, that poverty or the appearance of poverty was a barrier to people coming into the church and recognize a commitment within ourselves never to let that happen. That would, that would be wonderful, but, but there's always the other. There's always the outsider. There's always the person who, who doesn't fit the mold or, or our own personal narratives, who makes us uncomfortable or who isn't just like we are. The outsider, the person whose identity or appearance or personality lie just outside of where our comfort levels end. And maybe it's due to our inexperience uh, around people who are different than us or media influence or personal bias or opinion or preference or some other factor. But are we willing to have our own comfort, our own comfortable status quo disrupted in order to love that person or those people? If Jesus died for those people too, are we willing to live a life of love for them? Are we willing to allow our own status quo to be disrupted, to learn not just to tolerate others who are different from us, not just to coexist around them, but to truly and genuinely love them with a Christ-like love. Keeping the status quo means safe faith, faith that doesn't move us, faith that, that doesn't love outside of our bubble, faith that isn't open to correction or being broadened or challenged, faith that's fragile and needs to be protected. In fact, the status quo, it's not so much about faith at all, it's about religion. It's about protecting ideas. The Greek word for faith is pistos. And it can also be translated as trust. And so next time you're reading scripture and, and you come across the word faith, you can substitute the word trust and see how it changes that passage for you. It's about trusting Jesus. Abraham was not commended because he agreed with God's ideas. He wasn't commended because he, uh, he had some sort of intellectual agreement with God. He was commended because he trusted that God would do what he said he would do and he lived according to it. His faith was measured in trust. And religion or dogma is a set of statements that a person confirms or denies, but that isn't faith. That's intellectual agreement. Faith is saying, yes, he can, and yes, he will. He can transform. He can heal. He can redeem. He can bring about great and wonderful change. He can, and he does, and he will. I trust him, and I'll be a part of it. Faith is saying, the way of Jesus, even though it looks unlikely in this world, is the only way to victory. And what I've come to recognize is that people don't defend their faith because faith doesn't really need defending. He can and he does and he will. They defend their religion, their ideas and their intellect. Ideas and intellect don't compel us to love, but trust does, faith does. The Spirit of God alive in us does. And so on, on this Palm Sunday, as we remember Jesus walking down the road to Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, disrupting the religious status quo of his day and inviting people into trusting faith, and as we remember Paul blinded for a time as Jesus disrupted Paul's status quo of religious ideas, inviting him into a trusting faith, we remember, too, that we are invited to lower our defenses 
and to release our opinions and to lay down our ideas and the things that get in the way of loving people as Christ loves us and others. To enter into a deeper trust in the transformational Christ. We're invited to take great comfort in our faith. Christ is victorious over the powers of hell. Jesus wins. Love wins. We can take great comfort in those truths, but we're not invited into a faith whose primary attribute is that it's comfortable. We take comfort in the victory of Christ, but our faith isn't a comfortable faith because we're called to be shakers of the status quo. That's what it means to be a redeemed redeemer and a transformed transformer, that the work that Christ is doing in us, we then allow him to do through us. Uh, last week, Emily talked about sanctification. That's what sanctification boils down to, that Jesus does a new work in us. He transforms us according to his likeness. But that's just part one. And part two is that he then takes that transformed person and he uses it as a transformational presence in the world. And so as we become more like Christ internally, we become more like Christ externally. A transformational presence in the world. He transforms us so that we can act as transformers. I'm going to leave you with a few questions this week. Just to reflect on, ponder, questions for you to, to answer in your own heart. The first one is, how is the love of Christ compelling me today? How is it calling me to move? How is it sh disrupting my status quo? How is he transforming me, and how is he calling me to be a transformational presence in the world? How is he disrupting my status quo, and what wonderful good is he replacing it with? Let's pray today. Father, we pray today that you would remind us what it means to have faith in you, that it is a deep and abiding trust, not merely an agreement or a proclamation uh, of some disconnected truth, Lord, but, but something transformational. Teach us to trust in you and in your ways. Teach us, Lord, to, to not be content with the status quo kind of faith. But to be willing to have our status quo shaken and disrupted. Do new things in our hearts, we pray, Lord. Continue to, to build in us a trust that follows you wherever you would lead us. That as we are transformed, as our hearts are transformed, you would use us as a transformational presence in the world. Sanctify us through and through, we pray. Drawing us into your love and transforming us according to the image of Christ. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.